Hello and welcome to Stow Talks, a podcast designed to support people going through a relationship breakdown and all the challenges this brings. I'm Matthew Taylor. And I'm Lisa Gatchell, family lawyers at Stowe Family Law. And today we are joined by Dr. Supriya McKenna on how to rebuild your life following narcissistic abuse. So we are really pleased, Supriya, to have you join us again um, for another one of our podcasts to look at um, how to rebuild yourself um, following the narcissistic abuse. Can you just um, perhaps start, though, by giving us an introduction again to the work that you do and how you found yourself in this space? Yeah, so what I do, I, my original, I originally came from the, a, a, yeah, a medical background, so I was a GP. But now what I do is I give uh, people who are in narcissistic relationships practical help and emotional support. That's really what I'm doing um, under the radar quite often. So a lot of the work that I do um, is with people who are separating or divorcing from a narcissist, because actually that's when, um, uh, you know, behaviours get ramped up. So I find myself um, often managing their communications with the narcissist during that separation and divorce. Um, I can write their emails for them or their messages for them to reduce the drama and the conflict. Um, I strategize with them and and with their lawyer. And really the aim is to try and keep them out of court, um, try to keep costs down and help them to sort of uh, be able to to carry on um, post-divorce without without running into issues with the narcissist. Um, so, yeah, I help with that as well. But I also work with people who've been in other types of relationships with narcissists. So at work or with family members or friends. Um, I'm not a therapist. Um, that's uh, something that people sometimes think I am. But I'm not a therapist. But actually, I think that um, in this type of situation, clients actually often need something much more focused than therapy anyway, much more practical as well um, when trying to manage the narcissist in their lives. And um, I also train um, and educate various people in NPD, Narcissistic Personality Disorder, including divorce professionals, um, lawyers, judges, mediators, financial planners the other day, um, social workers um, uh, and the general public as well. So I give talks. um, I I have online courses and uh, I've got a couple of books um, as well, one of which is actually a current number one bestseller in the US. That one's Divorcing a Narcissist. The Leo, the Loss and the Law, and also I host a podcast called Narcissists and Divorce. And I'm writing my third book at the moment, which is called The Narcissist Trap, and that's for the general public. So really, it's I'm just doing everything I can, um, pretty much, basically. So so the queen of narcissism, although that probably sounded better in my head than it sounds out loud. <laughs> um, so just as an intro to this, I think it should probably explain that Obviously, you've been the podcast before, your first repeat podcast guest, which is great. And we're super excited to have you back, not least because the first session was so enlightening. We had such positive feedback from listeners and viewers on it. If anyone who is listening now hasn't watched or listened to the first podcast, Divorcing a Narcissist, that is really basically pause this go and listen or watch that and then come back to this because what that deals with is um, Supriya talks about what a narcissist is and um, ha- you know the issues that can arise during separation during divorce and, and extricating yourself from that uh, narcissistic relationship and so rather than us recap all of that because there's so much information involved the best thing is to go and watch or listen to that and then come back and we can talk now about rebuilding your life after narcissism and Um, The first thing to say before we get into it is the sort of disclaimers. When we're talking about narcissism, we are not talking about people who like looking in the mirror a lot. We're not talking about vain people. We're not talking about, you know, people who pose on Instagram. We are talking about people with narcissistic personality disorder, NPD. So um, if you now, hopefully you've already gone away, listen to the first one, come back. You now know all about narcissists. Great. What's not so great is we're now at this stage. We cut to the end of the divorce. You're separated from your narcissist. But that's not the end of things, is it, Supriya? So what factors then exist with the sort of post-separation abuse and how can you then rebuild your life after narcissism? Yeah, and it's not the end. Um, you know, that that decree absolute or, or that final order is not the end very often. Um, and that's really important to say because you can't really properly heal from narcissistic abuse unless you're actually no longer being abused. Um, and post-separation narcissistic abuse is a really big thing. Um, especially when you're, well, particularly when you're tied uh, to, to the narcissist via the children or via the finances. So that's that's really important to say. But you can limit um, that type of abuse. And that's all about sort of setting things up, really, during the divorce. Um, so um, 
the, the type and of course also the communication side of things so just to sort of briefly um tell you how to sort of try to to limit that post separation abuse in terms of communication you don't want to see them in person at all you never actually if you can avoid it you never see them in person um you don't take any phone calls from them so you never speak to them kind of you know actually at the time with so that there can be a back and forth type of communication there and then um, you pick one form of communication only, preferably email, because then you've got a bit of time to think about your responses um, and you can you can um, wait for a while and cool down before you do respond. Um, some people recommend Our Family Wizard. Our Family Wizard works with some narcissists, really high spectrum narcissists just use it as a weapon of abuse as well. So, um, you know, be caution with that, but it is potentially useful. Um so that and you want to block the the narcissist from other types of communication as many as you can essentially so that they can't just communicate with you and then you want to use a thing called the gray rock technique which i think we did talk about um mm -hmm. in the last um uh podcast so essentially you want to give them no reaction so if you happen to see them in person you you just you just turn into mr spock as i say no um facial expressions you use as few words as possible Try not to make eye contact with them and get out of there as quickly as you can. You want to be as boring to them as a grey rock. In other words, you don't want to give them any narcissistic supply. And we go into lots of uh, detail on what narcissistic supply is um, in the previous podcast as well. But that, again, is basic to understanding what narcissism is about. Um, and the other side of things is if you're tied to them by the ch with the children. So if you're tied through the children, the issues that you have are that they are going to use those children as weapons of abuse. You can't co-parent with a narcissist. You can basically, they just, they just counter-parent. They do the exact opposite of what you want them to do. Um, so if you come up with an idea, they will want the exact opposite um, because they want to cause the drama and the chaos um, and the havoc um, because they get that narcissistic supply, that fuel that they need um, from you by doing that. So they will just use the children as weapons of abuse. So really, you need to really get um, an arrangement in plan so that you can parallel parent. And I do, um, I, if, you, if you don't know what parallel parenting is, do Google it. Um, it's really, really important that you have to parallel parent with a narcissist. You can't expect them to come in and, you know, have a cup of tea uh, with you when, you pick, when they're picking up the children. And you can't expect them to sort of go to parents' evenings with you and be polite and, you, you know, it just isn't going to happen and go to birthday parties for the children together. That isn't going to happen. So you have to essentially get as close to no contact with that narcissistic parent as possible. Otherwise, they will abuse you. Essentially, that abuse will continue. So you want to arrange to have a parenting plan um, that's really robust and um, covers all the eventualities that could potentially happen. Uh, for example, the children should be uh, dropped off at school, picked up at school with their handover bags so that you don't have any any of this coming to the house. Um, otherwise, they'll be late or they'll they'll change things around. Um, it just it just doesn't work. Um, you want to be really clear on things like who holds the passports and when the passports, how many days before a holiday um, are the passports to be sort of handed to the other parent. Um, and you never change the schedule, um, the, the parenting schedule at all. So they might try and uh, cause havoc by doing that. Well, I'll have this Friday and you can, because you had two weekends on the trot, just stop all of that. You just stick rigidly to the schedule, no matter what. Um, so there's lots and lots of things that you need to look at in that parenting plan to stop post-separation abuse. What happens on Mother's Day? What happens on Father's Day? What happens on their birthdays? Often we say alternate years, each parent has the party, but you don't invite the other parent and you don't have to invite the other. Well, you, I mean, in fact, it's specifically in the parenting plan that, you know, that's not something that happens. You don't invite the other parent. Otherwise, the narcissist will say, well, why can't you invite me? Or I invited you, you know, and it will just be more um, excuses for communication. Um, and also, how do you communicate with the school? You know, what do you do at sports days? What do you do for school plays? What do you do for parents' evenings? Try to keep everything as separate as possible so that you don't give them the opportunity to, to get narcissistic supply from you. So essentially, they go away and get it from someone else. That's basically what you want to do. Um, and the other side of things is the financial side of things. So narcissists will financially abuse you post-separation as well. They just cause havoc with that. So when if you haven't yet got divorced... Really, if, if there's any way you can get a clean break, lump sum, do so. Because if you're getting ma uh, maintenance from the narcissist, 
they often won't pay or they'll pay late or they'll play you in dribs and drabs. It's all about drama. It's all about chaos. It's all about causing you fear. Um, and sometimes they just stop or they'll take you back to court and they'll say, um, I, you know, I, I want to I want to discharge this maintenance. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm not paying it anymore. You know, I'm not working anymore or I'm ill or I'm going to take early retirement or whatever. And they'll hide their earnings and do all the things they did during the divorce all over again. Um, so you can't actually rely on spousal maintenance um, as an ongoing thing, you know, and it can be very, very stressful indeed. So I, I really, I do. I have to say, if you can get a clean break, go for it. Um, and also, if they don't pay, if they're self-employed, you can take them back to court and it can be enforced much harder. Sorry, if they're employed, if they're self-employed, you can take them back to court and you can try to get the maintenance to continue. But it's much, much harder. Um, it's a much more complicated process if they're self-employed. And so many narcissists are self-employed. Um, it seems to be um, the way that they can get sort of high up in the food chain and, and sort of, you know, have more power and uh, wealth and status. Um, so, yeah, you're also going to have to accept that you are going to have to become financially independent as quickly as possible. And just forget about what the narcissist owes you because, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, and also just be really careful that your solicitors and your barrister looks at loopholes in the orders and closes any loopholes down. Um, things like when does child maintenance um, come to an end? Exactly what month? There's loads of loopholes that can be left in financial orders. So it's really important that you look at that. And actually, we do cover that off in, in our book, uh, Divorcing a Narcissist as well. So do have a look at that. Um, so, yeah, that's um, that's how I think you you need to set up your life. Um, so that you you can reduce the amount of post separation abuse that um, that you get essentially. So when you're looking then to move on, um, is that there's always a risk sometimes, particularly when we're looking at things like domestic abuse, that if you've been the victim of domestic abuse, you potentially um, find yourself in similar positions again. Mm -hmm. Is that likely to happen? with uh if you've been in a relationship with somebody that's got narcissistic personality disorder and what can somebody do to make sure that that doesn't happen yeah it, it is it's very very likely um there's that uh, that saying um you find the person whose teeth fit your wounds and essentially and a lot of people will call this victim blaming so you know and I, i'm but i'm just going to say this and you know i'm sure lots of people go oh that's blaming the victim you're awful but you know if you have been brought up for example by a narcissist there'll be certain wounds that you've sustained by, you know, through your childhood. And that's probably what, for about 50% actually, of the people who come to me um, who, who are divorcing a narcissist um, have had, a, 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 you know, been brought up in a narcissistic household. So they've got a narcissistic parent. So, you know, that's what I mean by you find the person whose teeth fit your wounds. But if you haven't kind of closed up those wounds, um, another narcissist is likely to come along and kind of latch on. So it's very, very important um, that you, you're careful about when you date um, and you really, you know, you need to be out of the whole divorce process um, and you really need to look at, there's all sorts of things you need to look at in you um, to see whether there was anything about you that, um, you know, that made you attractive uh, to a narcissist. So there's all sorts of traits um, that people have. And, um, and, you know, again, I'm not blaming the victim here at all. And my clients, you know, when I run through these things, they're always saying, yep, that's me. Yep, that's me. That's, you know, they admit it. They go, that's me. That's exactly who I am. <laughs> so things like um, having poor boundaries. So I don't think I've, I've had a single client who hasn't said that they, they have really poor boundaries, particularly um, in intimate relationships. So, you know, they'll, they'll say no to something quite often, but they won't really mean it. And the narcissist will push their boundaries and they'll give in. And then they'll resent, you know, having uh, given in uh, and on it goes. So they, you know, often say they've got poor boundaries. So, you know, a boundary being where you end and someone else begins. So and it's really important to have. I mean, very often people don't even know what boundaries are. You know, people who've been in narcissistic relationships, um, they don't know that they get to sort of say what is acceptable to them and, and what isn't acceptable uh, to them. So it's really important to, to, to be able to say that and to not worry about how people are going to react. You know, no, I don't, you know, I'm not going to eat past 8 p.m. Um, I don't do that. You know, just just being able to say simple that, no, I won't wait more than 15 minutes. If you don't turn up, I am going to go. Or no, I, I don't want you driving my car um, without asking me. Um, all, there's all sorts of boundaries that um, 
that narcissists exploit. Um, and they need to really think about that. You know, how are they with boundaries? Do people tend to cancel on them a lot, you know, um, at the last minute? And that's a sign sometimes of, of poor boundaries or or feeling resentful uh, towards people as well because they end up doing things for them they didn't really want to do. That, again, is a sign of poor boundaries. Um, so that's one thing that they need to look at. Just think about learning how to set boundaries, um, uh, you know, because it, it really is a, a big one. Um, the other thing I think that people um, people tend to to have problems with um, is um, they tend to be people pleasers. Um, not you know people very often they're people pleasers. So if somebody asks them to do something, they'll immediately say yes. They won't think about you know um, the effects on them. They won't even think about it. Someone asks them, they say yes, or they'll jump through hoops to to make sure that the other person is okay and they just won't consider themselves they'll put other people's needs first um, and that is a sign really of codependency that, that idea of putting someone else's needs first always um putting your own needs and it, actually again do you know what your needs are you know what are your needs and again very often people will say well what's a need I, what is a need you know um they just won't have a clue so really i think they need to look at that um you know, what are your needs? Um, how can you assert them? How can you make sure that you get them met? You know, how can you, you might feel really awkward about asking people to meet your needs, but actually it's a normal thing to do. Um, so they need to get comfortable with that. There's a lot of things that are going to make them feel really uncomfortable when someone asks them to do something, you know, to help them, you know, instead of just jumping in and saying, yes, stop and think, well, hang on, how does that affect me? Is that going to work for me? And actually learn to say no you know a, a lot of that's probably um sort of conditioned behavior isn't it Supriya? because if you spent so many years you know having to act in a certain way to avoid a narcissist losing their rag and you know for, for life to be made of misery and you know if you keep the narcissist happy then your life's going to be a bit easier but you end up creating a rod for your own back that, it strikes me that there's a lot of conditioning it's something i see in my clients who have been in narcissistic relationship that they will be you, you know they they will you know, just be used to acting in a certain way and trying to break the cycle of that behavior and those responses strikes me as being a really difficult thing to do. Is that something you see a lot? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, and it's chicken and egg, isn't it? You know, was it the narcissist that caused them to become a, a people pleaser or were they a people pleaser before? And did that attract the narcissist to them? Was that, you know, was that part of it? Um it, It's hard to know. I mean, I think probably these traits get a lot more prominent at, when you're in a narcissistic relationship mm. but whether you're sort of predisposed to it anyway it's hard, it's really hard to know isn't it but again if you've been brought up by a narcissist then you are going to be that way probably anyway because you have you've been jumping through hoops and trying to please someone else your entire life you know um so yeah that must lead to a lot of low confidence i would imagine as well yeah well i think the not the abuse itself leads to, to, to low confidence um, very much and I think we ought to, we need to sort of talk about that really because that's a big factor in healing from narcissistic abuse but you know some of the other things that you know attract narcissists to you um, if you're a rescuer um, and I always get people nodding emphatically on that one um, you know they they feel like they just need to rescue people they'll always jump in and help people out um, if you're blindly compassionate you know or just really really empathic but to the point of not actually sort of seeing what's really going on. And you just give and give and give and you just forgive and forgive and forgive. That's another one. You know, that belief as well that love conquers all. Well, you know, that can really, that's brilliant for a narcissist, you know, because they will say to you, you just need to love me more. You know, that's what's wrong here. And you'll go, oh my God, that's right. I do. I just need to love you more. And again, that's just a one way street, isn't it? Of just it's giving and giving and giving while the narcissist takes and takes and takes. And then the other sort of group of people, the so-called echoists who are at the opposite end of um, the spectrum to narcissists, they feel undeserving. They don't want to feel special at all. And one of the things that one of the signs of that is, um, how, you know, how do you feel when someone gives you a compliment? You know, are you able to go, oh, thank you very much? Or do you go, oh, no, you know, my hair actually looks terrible. Um, in fact, you know, it's never looked worse. And, you know, um, or, you know, uh, well, thank you for, you know, someone says, well, you did a really good presentation. Oh, well, actually, that wasn't really me. You know, that was Sheila in the office that mostly did that. And I just sort of stood up and said it, but I thought I was a bit rubbish. And, you know, very often you get people who are absolutely rubbish at accepting compliments because it makes them feel so uncomfortable. Um, you know, 
and, and things like if you get a lovely present, um, you know, um, some something really posh, say, and you think, oh, no, I, I can't use that. I'm going to save that for best, you know, or I'm going to give that to someone who actually deserves it. You know, just look at that in yourself. You know, and go and get that bubble bath and use it. You know, make a point of doing the opposite of what you have done. You know, just be aware of, of that type of thing in you that attracts, you know, attracts narcissists to you. And also the other thing is, you know, lots of people don't realise that they have the right to change their mind. You know, I, I very often ask my clients, like, did you know, I'll say to them, did you know that you had the right to change your mind? And they look absolutely, did, do I? They're absolutely shocked, you know. I have the right to change my mind, you know, it, they just, it's a completely new concept to them because the narcissist has held them to whatever they've said for years and years and years, you know, and you have to stick to it. That's it. That's what we've said. That's what we're, we've agreed. And that's it. Well, no, I have the right to change my mind. So they, you know, do that, change your mind and be okay about it. And you don't have to explain yourself. So there's lots of things that they need to look at in themselves. And, you know, as I say, I'm not blaming them at, at all. It's not victim blaming, but these traits definitely are predominant in many of the people who, who do find themselves in narcissistic relationships. So when you're looking at somebody and you're saying, okay, you need to work out what your needs are and what you want to do next, um, where, where do they start? Yeah. Okay. So firstly, um, so putting your needs first, well, that, for, well, what are your needs? That's, that's probably the first place to start. So no, and, and some people are fine about this, but you know, but if you, if you don't know what your needs are, usually um, your emotions will give you a clue essentially. And people who don't know what their needs are usually aren't very good at naming their emotions. So this is a really good exercise. So, you know, most people think of feelings as being, you know, um, I'm sad, I'm happy, um, I'm angry, I'm scared. You know, that's it. Those are my four emotions. But actually, if you can get really deep on your emotions, um, that's the first step really to, to, to on trying to work out your needs. So what actually are your emotions? You know, in the moment, how are you actually feeling? Um, you know, are you feeling, when you say I'm sad, do you mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel um, defeated, you know? Um, when you say I'm happy, do you mean I feel, um, you know, free, carefree, you know, um, just get right in and actually work out exactly how you're feeling. Just keep going until you've got the exact the exact feeling. And then essentially, once you get good at identifying what your emotions are, because a narcissist, by the way, wasn't interested in your emotions. You didn't do it. You know, you weren't allowed to have emotions if they weren't the right emotions. And then you'd have been gaslit into, you know, you're not allowed that emotion. That's wrong. You've got to have this emotion. So, you, you know, over time, over decades, you might have found yourself just totally not engaging with your emotions. So this is why this is so important to really get in touch with them. Um, so, you know, identify your emotions. And then basically, once you once you can do that, you can work out how to, to get more of the good emotions and, and less of the bad. So, for example, if you feel sad, but actually you feel lonely, you realise that it's actually not sadness, it's loneliness, then, of course, you can do something about that. You need to plan a social activity, whatever, join a club, do, you know, do whatever it is you need to do. And you can identify that as a need. I need more social interaction. So that's how you do it. So you start with your emotions, start with how you're feeling and really try to engage with them and work out what they're telling you, what they actually are. And, uh, and yeah, that's that's how you do it, really. Um, that's the first step in, in working out what, what your needs are. Um, you asked me something else following on from that. About your wants. Yeah. Now, that's really difficult, actually, because, again, um, when you've been in a narcissistic relationship, your wants are irrelevant. Um, it just doesn't matter what you want. If you think of the narcissist as a sun, you're orbiting that sun, you're their planet and you're orbiting them um, and everything is about them. So your wants become completely irrelevant and you don't often know what your wants even are. You take on the narcissist wants very often um, and that's that's a real problem as well. So one of the things that I, um, I like to tell people to try is... Um, um, it's a thing called the rocking chair test. And what you do, this is all in the book, by the way. I've got all these sort of strategies um, in the book for in the moving on, moving forward section. But what you do is you imagine yourself as a whatever, 95-year-old, you know, woman or man sitting on your rocking chair, on your veranda, you know, wherever it would be good for you. Where, you know, you're old and you've made it to, you know, 
maybe you're 100 and you've made it to exactly how, how, as old as you want to make it to. And you look back on your life and you're happy. You're in a really happy place. And you look back and you ask yourself, what happened? What, what happened to make me this happy? You know, and it's a really interesting um, it's a really interesting way of doing it because you're sort of reversing things. So you just pull, you, so what, what happened? And you might find that, oh, well, you know, my children grew up and they had grandchildren and I, I'm really good, I'm really good terms with them and I see them all the time or, you know, I, I did really well at work and, uh, but I was able to balance it with my home life. And there's all these things that you might, that might be really important for you, you know, that actually you hadn't really thought about when you were with the narcissist because everything was about them so it kind of helps you to work out what you actually want um you know in your life you know um you know you might be sitting in a massive house or you might be sitting in a tiny little house you might be by the sea you might you know what do you actually want um uh, and it's a really powerful powerful test you write everything down you know as you're doing it you sort of have a stream of consciousness you just write it all down in categories um so you might want to do health you might want to do um um you know relationships so family um intimate relationships um work you know um leisure break it down into those categories and and you know what happened in your life to make you this happy as that old person on that rocking chair and it's a really really powerful one i mean actually everyone should do it but you might find that all those things that you thought were important were actually the narcissists um, wants rather than yours or society's wants you know what society was telling you you needed to do to be happy you know so it's just so powerful and I actually do it all of you do it because it's brilliant you'll, re- you'll love it it's a great exercise well I couldn't help myself start to do it when you were talking about <laughs> it and I'm clearly going to be doing it later <laughs> since tonight thinking through my own rocking chair um what about um and that is really powerful. And I think it's a really good reflexive way to to look at things and to identify what's important to you. But for I guess for some people, even doing that must be quite intimidating and quite scary. And there must be a number of people who are experiencing sort of diagnosed mental health conditions as a result of the narcissistic abuse. So, I mean, it, am I right? Is that is that something that's common? Is that something that you see a lot of? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So anxiety, um, depression, or, you know, low mood that isn't depression, but that is just, you know, persistent low mood. Um, so many people just keep going back. And the ruminations are huge with narcissistic abuse. They just keep going right back to, to and, and thinking about it or thinking about the narcissist. Um, they're worried about the future. So they're catastrophizing. Um, you know, um, they're trying to plan everything 20 steps ahead. Um, they're worrying about the post-separation abuse as well, quite often, very mm. easily triggered. And again, you know, that's down to the um, the post-separation abuse. Any in any time an, they get an email from the narcissist, say, or anything that remotely looks like a, a solicitor's letter from their solicitor, they're right back where they were. Um, and also, really frighteningly, there's a thing called complex PTSD, um, and that is um, a lot of people don't even realise they've got it. But it's it's huge, actually, complex PTSD, um, and it, it really is. It sw- it sideswipes people. So it's different from normal PTSD. You know, we think of PTSD as you know a soldier, you know, um, having yeah. you know, someone in a war zone, or or someone has a car crash, for example. One massive awful thing happens, and they keep having visual flashbacks to that one massive awful thing. They just can't, you know, they wake up in the night and they they're there. It's like they're there again, and they can see it. They're actually there, and that it's complex PTSD isn't like that it's where you've had much smaller traumas but a lot of them and they've built up um so you don't tend to have the visual component at all it's it's emotional flashbacks um and it's really really difficult for people because it just runs them over it bulldozes them over it sideswipes them and you know the triggers can be um memories a memory can or you can pick up a vase that you bought in a in a shop with the narcissist in 1982 you know and and that will take you right back and you'll you know and you'll get on this train of thoughts you know and you'll start blaming yourself and your inner critic will kick in and and then you'll you know say this train of thought and you'll 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 feel really bad about the whole thing and you'll be you'll you'll just be swept away and you know you just end up in a in a in a big crumpled heap um and that is really really difficult for people because it can come at any time anything can bring it on uh so that's really really difficult um so that's something that that needs to be um you really need to look at that 
And there's a brilliant book actually um, called, um, well, actually, is it called? I'm not sure what it's called, but it's by, it's called Complex PTSD. I can't remember the tagline, um, but it's by Pete Walker. So do look, it's the book really on Complex PTSD. So do look that up. Um, people in Complex PTSD tend to be triggered and go into one of the four um, types of, so yeah, there's fl- we all know about flight, we all know about fight, we all know about freeze, but lots of people don't know about fawn. And the fawn reflex is really big in complex PTSD. So if you're the type of person that gets triggered and starts fawning, you know, you start trying to, you know, okay, I can make this okay. I'll do what you say. You know, very often people who've been in narcissistic relationships go into that kind of um, reaction. um, And that doesn't help them really when they're dealing with a narcissist. So, And again, that's part of the complex PTSD. And as I say, Pete Walker describes that um, and explains how you can get over that really, really well um, in his book. So do have a look at that. And I assume if people have got, um, you know, medical conditions such as anxiety, depression, PTSD, first point of call is to is to go and see their GP and make sure um, that they're getting the help that they need. What other things can what other things can they do? Is there anything else that they can do? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots, actually. Um, There's lots because actually with this type of say with the depression or the, the low mood, um and even with the anxiety of it medication probably isn't actually going to help you know the underlying problem and if you've got a clinical depression then you know and the gp prescribes antidepressants and you're happy to do that then go for it absolutely you know um but really you need to get on top of this this is a reaction to you having been abused that's what this is um so one of the best things you can do is meditation and mindfulness and it sounds crazy i sound like a kind of hippie saying this But actually, um, it's been shown over and over again that meditation and mindfulness actually increases the density of grey matter uh, in the prefrontal cortex of the brain and does things in various other areas of the brain over eight weeks. If you meditate every day for eight weeks or 20 minutes a day, they've shown that that you get an increased amount of grey matter in the prefrontal cortex. It's absolutely phenomenal. So what, what does that mean? Well, it means that you essentially raise your threshold for um for for being triggered that's one of the things um that it does but also it it allows you to examine your thoughts it allows you to become a master of your thoughts really rather than a slave to them now i was talking about that complex ptsd sort of sw- side swiping you and you get on that train of thoughts and you don't get off until you're that crumpled heap well meditation and mindfulness allows you to step back have the thought and think well do i want to engage with this with this thought it's here i don't like it you know, what is it? What's what's got, you know, but do I need to engage with it? Or can I can I let this go? You know, so it really lets puts you back in the driving seat. It's so powerful. And it works really, really very quickly indeed. And of course, there are no side effects from meditation. It's free. You know, we've got a cost of living crisis. It's I, mean, I don't know a single therapist who deals with this kind of work who doesn't um, try to get their um, clients to do this as well as ha- having therapy it, everybody uh, uses mindfulness and actually Pete Walker mentions it as well in his book it's huge it's I can't tell you how huge it is so um, there are courses um, that you can do um, to do it properly um, there's a, a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy MBCT is one of the courses that you can do or you can do um, mindfulness-based stress reduction MBSR and they're eight week courses you go once a week for a couple of hours um, and um, it's a group thing and you're taught all the tools and then you have meditation homework Um, and it's just it really is absolutely brilliant so I just cannot recommend that enough and also to say meditation and mindfulness is actually um, in the nice guidelines as a treatment for recurrent depression so it really it's, it's actually real i'm not making this up you know um and the buddhists actually got it right 2500 years ago but without knowing why but it's actually been you know it's been validated by neuroscience so that's one of the biggest things you can do and if you don't know whether you're going to like it get the headspace app or the calm app and just have a go you know just see how you feel about it it's you know it's easy to do um so just try it um and the other thing that's really good at rewiring the brain is the practice of gratitude. And um, I think this was all quite sort of trendy. People were talking about gratitude three or four years ago all the time. But uh, it really is immensely powerful um, because we have a negativity bias as human beings. So we tend to, you know, negative thoughts are sticky. 
and positive thoughts, we just kind of let go. So if something good happens in the day, we tend to go, oh, that's good. And then we just kind of let it go. But, you know, we can have three good things happen and one bad thing. And that bad thing will, you know, ruin our day. And we'll, you know, come home and go, it was awful. I had a terrible day because this happened. And we'll have forgotten about the three good things because that's what the human brain is designed to do because it keeps us safe. You know, that's an evolutionary thing. It's to keep us safe. But actually, it's not that useful. It's a bit outmoded these days, a bit outdated. So the practice of gratitude actually combats that. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you can remember to notice 10 things per day, and I mean the tiniest things, the things that you're grateful for. So literally, you wake up in the morning, you turn on the tap and you've got hot water on your hands, the feel of that hot water on your hands, that kind of thing, tiny little things that you're grateful for. You know, um, you, you're driving to work and some kids have just got off the bus and they're having a good laugh, you know, and you and it just makes you smile. But, you know, and that gives you that's that warmth, you know, that's that's another thing to be grateful for. Remember that, you know. And so when you go to bed every night, so remember to do it through the day. Remember to notice those things. And then when you go to bed, just before you go to sleep with te your 10 fingers, remember those things and engage with the feeling. You know, how did I feel? Close your eyes. How did I feel when that happened? You know, and just quickly just run through them. And if you do that for just it doesn't take any time at all um, for that to just really change the whole way in which you view the world. I mean, it's so powerful. It's I mean, really it's so powerful. And again, it's free, you know, um, and people who practice gratitude just don't ever stop um, because it's just so, so brilliant. It really does have the power to change your life. Such a simple thing. I think it's really reassuring to hear how positivity can kind of get you through this because a lot of this, you know, when we talk about narcissism, a lot of it's the negative emotions. You were talking about identifying emotions before, and it seems to me that one of the, the key negative emotions is, is fear and fear about getting drawn back into another narcissistic relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, how do people get over that and I guess rebuild the trust and faith in other people that they're not going to end up within the narcissist? That must be a big challenge, even if you've come to terms with what you've been through previously. Yeah, yeah. So I mean so once you've done your work and you've worked out how to what your needs are and you've worked out what you want and you've worked out, you know, how to to, to say no to people and have boundaries and you know you, 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 all of those things that we talked about earlier. It, that trust thing is huge. And there's an absolutely brilliant um, video by Brené Brown. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Brené Brown. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. she's a, tr a vulnerability researcher, um, American lady, a Texan lady. Um, absolutely brilliant. Um, and it, it's called The Anatomy of Trust. And it's actually on my website, thelifedoctor.org. So I've got it in my video section because it's brilliant. Um, so that's the easy way to find it. But essentially what she's done is she's she's broken down what trust is. Um, and, it's you know, she's not talking about narcissism when she talks about trust. Um, but actually, it's just such a useful thing to think about. So she's got this um, acronym braving, essentially. And braving, um, I'll just run through it. So the B is for boundaries. We've al already talked about boundaries, but only trust people who are respectful of your boundaries. You know, you need to make a commitment to these things. So this is just a really good way of doing it. So only trust people who respect your boundaries. Um, reliability is the R in braving. Only trust people who always do what they say they're going to do. That's really big because narcissists do not do that. You know, they do not do what they say they're going to do. Um, accountability is the A. Only trust people who can own up to their mistakes and actually apologize for them and mean it. Again, narcissists don't apologize for their mistakes and mean it. You know, and these people need to be able to make amends for their mistakes as well. So only trust people who can hold themselves accountable. I can hold their hands up and say, that was wrong. It was wrong for these reasons. I'm going to do this to make it up to you. I'm sorry. You know, again, you're not, there's no way that you're going to, you know, fall for a narcissist if, if that, you know, if you, if you only trust people who are, who are accountable. Um, the V is for the vault. So, and again, this is another one, you know, it, this is about gossip, really. So um, only trust people who don't share other people's personal information uh, behind their backs. 
So, you know, gossip, again, narcissists do this all the time. Um, and often people sort of, you know, if you don't know someone, you know, if you can sort of, you know, be nasty about someone with them, it's a way of building the relationship, you know. Um, it's a quick way sometimes to build a relationship with someone because you've got this thing in common, you know, we don't like Fiona in the office or whatever, you know. Um, but actually, um, it, you know, it's a red flag, isn't it, really, when it comes to trust. So so that's really important as well. Don't go for only trust people who don't gossip behind people's backs, essentially. And don't do yourself, obviously. Um, you know, but you probably don't, because if you were the victim of narcissistic abuse, you're not that kind of person, uh, more than likely. Um, integrity um, is the I in braving. So only trust people who live in accordance with their values. And we need to talk about values, by the way, um, you know, people who actually live by their values they do what's right instead of what's easy that kind of person um uh, the n is non-judgment non-judgmental so don't trust um, only trust people who don't judge you when you're sharing your vulnerabilities now again people will be listening to this and going oh my god because that again is the opposite of what a narcissist does you share your vulnerabilities at the beginning they're you know they're listening to everything and they're you know they're sort of assimilating it all but then they they take those vulnerabilities and they fire them straight back at you as weapons. And through the relationship, as a re relationship progresses, you will not be able to share your vulnerabilities with a narcissist. You have to keep them absolutely quiet. You're not allowed to have vulnerabilities. It's not the done thing at all. So again, it's it, you know this is all very relevant to narcissism. And then finally, the G, generosity. So only trust those who assume the most generous things about your words and your intentions and your behavior. So if you say something that might be um, a bit, you know, you know, people could misconstrue it um, as being negative. If you've said something for it, you know, and they think it's negative. Well, really, only trust people who give you the benefit of the doubt and assume that you can't have meant that. You can't have meant it in a negative way. You probably didn't mean it in a negative way. Um, you know, uh, uh, people who will be generous about that with you and then take you aside and talk to you about it and make sure, um, uh, you know, that uh, that you meant a certain thing. You know, so again, just somebody who's who's generous about your words, your intentions and your behaviours without assuming bad reasons for them. So that those are the, the, the things that Brené Brown talks about um, in much better than I could possibly talk about <laughs> them. And she's absolutely brilliant. So do watch the video. But I think this is just key, absolutely key to staying safe, to being able to, to have a relationship after, um, because it gives you something to really focus on. You know, it's really clear, it's something to focus on, and you can tick those things off. You know, if you see a red flag, it's all in there. You know, a lot of the red flags are actually in there. So I just think that's, that's a really, really um, good way of, of learning how to trust after narcissistic abuse and you know trust is not something that you give freely and then you know you allow somebody to erode that trust you know trust is something that has to be earned it does you know you've got to get rid of that belief that you just give your trust freely to everybody because a lot of people naturally have that belief and that's not true as as Brené Brown will you know beautifully uh, describes that's really useful and it's actually really helpful for everybody isn't it as a way of of, of looking at trust um you mentioned values and you said you wanted to come back to values. Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, I think a lot of people who come out of these relationships, they they don't know who they are. They don't know what they need. They don't know what they want. We, we've sort of said that already. But often they don't know what their values are. They don't know what their strengths are. Um, you know, they, they just... They just don't know who they are. They feel like a sort of shell, you know, a shadow of their former selves. And they've been devalued. They've been um, ridiculed. They've been put down, demeaned. You know, they've been told that they're rubbish at everything. They don't know who they are and they don't know what they want and they don't know what their values are and what their strengths are. And values and strengths, I think, are really important to, to, to get a, a grip on. So um, and also I want to talk about, you know, the, the personality testing as well in this. You know, if you have been in a relationship for 10 years or 20 years or or more and you haven't really you haven't been seen as a person. That's, again, a really big thing about narcissistic personality, uh, narcissistic abuse. You are not a person. You are not a three dimensional person um, with your own sort of, you know, we just you are an it. You are an object and you exist um, for the narcissist, you know, to give the narcissist narcissistic supply. 
And that's, you know, that's really important. So you, you, you get to feel like I'm just an it, I'm just a nobody. So get get into some personality testing. Just, in, you know, you've spent no time thinking about who you are. And now this is the time to really work out who you are. So personality testing is brilliant. You know, just get online. Everything's online. Myers-Briggs, you know, and the DISC personality uh, testing thing, the four colours, um, the the big five model, all of that. Just just indulge yourself, you know, and to be selfish, you know, indulge yourself. Who am I? You know, what are my values? Um, there's a brilliant, um, I mean, there's all sorts of ways of looking at it. Again, there are tests and uh, on online for values. Just get into them, get it, Google it, find a, find a, a list of values and work out which ones yours are. Um, and in terms of strengths as well, to move forwards, really, what am I good at? You know, I've been told I'm rubbish at everything. Um, you know, you can't cook, you can't clean, you can't dance, you can't write, you can't, you know, whatever it is that you've been told and that you can't do, because you will have been told those things if you've been um, in a relationship with a narcissist. You know, is that, is that true? You know, what are my strengths? And um, I always suggest that people do the VIA Institute's um, test on strengths. Um, it's it's called the VIA Institute, VIA Institute on Character. Um, and it's free. There's an online um, survey. And I think there's 25 uh, strengths and you fill out the thing and it ranks your strengths in order. And it's really interesting. Um, so, you know, those types of things are really important. This is a time for you to really focus on who you are, finding out who you, before you step out there and, and live your narcissist free life, you know, who am I? What do I want? And all of this is about looking at yourself and working out you know, who you are. It's so good to hear such positivity and to hear uh, and all those resources sound amazing. I'm sure they'll be really useful for anyone listening. And it's just, um, you know, narcissism such a, an impossible thing to live with. And it's, um, you know, such a dark time and, to, and such a, a difficult experience to come through that. It's just really reassuring to hear that I'm sure anyone listening to it who's been through a narcissistic relationship will be feeling a lot more positive about being able to come through and, and thrive really after it. Because mm -hmm. you can. You can thrive after it. You know, it really is possible to thrive after it. This does not have to break you. I mean, some people will go as far as to say, you know, that the narcissist... Um, essentially showed you um, your your vulnerabilities and your wounds, um, you know, and that you should be grateful to them. I don't know if you should be grateful to them. You know, it might have been an easier life without. But what I can say is that this is an opportunity for post-traumatic growth. This is really important, actually. You know, um, people always think, oh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress, that's the consequence of trauma. But post-traumatic growth is actually also a consequence of trauma. Um, if And th this is you know, some of these little tips and strategies are all ways to really get into that post-traumatic growth. So actually, you can be um, more evolved and, you know, just a happier person um, and ha having grown um, more than you would have been if you hadn't met the narcissist, if you see what I mean. This kind of healing process can bring you on further than perhaps where you would have been had you not been in a narcissistic relationship. Not that I'm saying, you know, that it was, you know, a great thing and, you know, you, you should be grateful. I mean, I'm not saying that at all. It, it really sucks. You know, it sucked. But, um, but there are things that can come out of it if, if, you, if, you, can, if you can look to the future. And, and it is about working on yourself. And it's actually really about taking that time and committing. Because these things take commitment, you know. So take that time to, to, to work on yourself. Um, and yeah, you can definitely, definitely heal. Definitely. I mean, one of the other things I wanted to talk about, if I may, is um, a thing called the reverse bucket list, which I came across in a magazine years ago. Um, and I thought this was just brilliant. Um, it's got nothing to do with, you know, I, I didn't, it wasn't in the context of narcissism. But if you've been devalued and put down your whole, you know, for whatever decades, or, or even less than that, Again, you, you, you don't know what you can do. You don't know what you're good at. And you've forgotten all the things that you have done in your life. So this reverse bucket list is basically you, you go back in time again, only now you go back to like the, your very earliest memory. You know, you might have been four and you might have done a drawing that the teacher put up on a, you know, a, a, in the, a, you know, in the, in the hallway in, at school and, you know, gave you a prize for it. But you go back to your earliest memory and you remember right from then to now all the achievements that you've ever had, no matter how small they were, you know, just when you felt proud, you know, when you were held up as having done something, good, you know, you might have been Mary in the nativity, aged five. I mean, literally that far back. 
And you'll find, you know, that as you go through it chronologically, and again, write it all down, get yourself, meditate first if you can, if, if you're doing what I've said and you're meditating, meditate first and then come into it. Because it, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing to do. And, you, you know, you write it all down and you, you realise, gosh, I've done so much, actually. There's so much that I can be proud of. And again, that helps you to work out what your strengths are as well, because there'll be, you know, recurring themes in there. So again, it's that focusing on you. And when you're feeling really bad about yourself, you can take that list out and you can look at it and you go, well, hang on. You know, I've done all of these things that, you know, I achieved in all of these different ways. And it doesn't have to be, you know, um, actual, you know, I got, you know, whatever in my GCSEs. You know, it, it doesn't have to be that kind of achievement. It can be, you know, um, I was kind to someone. It's that it's, it's what made you feel proud of yourself. So it's just, again, it's another way of engaging with yourself and reminding yourself of who you are. So that's another important one. So moving on then to look at things like therapy, um, do people need to undertake therapy? What therapy would be good um, if that's something they're looking into and how could therapy potentially help people? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And actually, I asked this question of... Um, uh, there's a there's a New York psychotherapist who's one of the biggest names in the world in narcissism. Uh, her name's Dr. Eleanor Greenberg. And actually, again, another person to look up. She does a brilliant um, psychology to get today um, articles. Absolutely brilliant on narcissism. She gets one point eight million views per month writing about narcissism. Yeah, per month. Uh, writing about narcissism on Quora. So she's huge. And uh, I interviewed her on our podcast. And I thought, I'm going to ask a psychotherapist this question because, you know, you're going to, you know, I might get a skewed answer in favour of psychotherapy. But Eleanor being Eleanor, very straight talking, said, no, you don't actually need therapy um, to heal from narcissistic abuse. Well, what she actually said was not everybody does, not at all. It's not a given because I think a lot of people get into this mindset. I'm never going to heal because I can't have therapy because it's expensive and I can't afford it. That's not true. You know, I mean, some people are going to need therapy. It depends on who you are as to how, you know, how you heal, you know, um, what your background was, what you went through, um, you know, your inborn temperament, all of those things, you know, who who's your support network. Um, there's so much really that, 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 you know, influences whether you actually need therapy to heal. So, you know, a lot of people, most people probably actually don't need therapy. They might choose to do it, but, you know, they don't need it necessarily. So that's, that's the first thing I want to say there. Um, you know, if you can't afford it, it doesn't mean it's curtains for you. You're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. Not at all. And there are things that you can do, which I'll just I'll go into in a second. But if you are going to go for therapy, you have to go for the right therapist. You have to go for a therapist who understands narcissism, narcissistic abuse, or at the very least, someone who understands trauma, um, because otherwise they are going to invalidate you. Um, unfortunately, and I hear this all the time because what they do is they make it about you. What could you have done differently in that situation? That kind of thing. Well, I was being abused and I know you don't understand that this is narcissism, but it is. You know, you don't want to be teaching your therapist about narcissism. So it's not, you know, you don't want to go there if they don't fully understand um, narcissistic abuse um, or, or trauma you know, don't go there, basically. So, so that's really important. And you want someone who's actually accredited, um, you know, someone that's really robust to so someone um, on the from, on the counselling directory. Um, there are various other organisations, the BACP, the BABCP, the UKCP um, and the BPS, the British uh, Psychological Society, I think is what that stands for, I think. Um, but anyway, you can find all those, those people who are accredited on those organisations um, are the people you want to be going for. And then I just want to mention EMDR because lots of people um, talk about EMDR. So that's um, a really interesting form of therapy. Essentially, the, you, essentially the therapist moves, the, may, moves their finger from right to left and you follow their finger with your eyes whilst you reprocess um, uh, your, the trauma, essentially, the traumas that you've been going through. And that sounds really weird, but the right to left engagement of the brain actually enables you to... to, to um, to, to process trauma so basically what that does um, and it's particularly good for complex PTSD if you are struggling with complex PTSD what that does is instead of it just kind of coming out of nowhere and sideswiping you it essentially 
connects it to where it should be so that you can kind of relegate it to the right bit of the, the basement, really, of your brain. It doesn't need to be coming up all the time and, you know, slapping you in the face. You want to put it in the basement and kind of close the lid on it. Go, right, I've processed that now, you know. So that's what EMDR does. That helps a lot of people. Um, so it sounds completely quack, uh, like it's quackery. Totally isn't. Again, it's scientifically validated. Um, so that's that's another one. Um, acceptance and commitment therapy is another one that people tend to use. Um, so uh, therapists that, that, that do that sort of thing. Some people are using psychedelics. They're going abroad and they're using psychedelics. Apparently, I, I mean, I've never done it, um, but apparently I have had therapists who work in this field uh, tell me about this. And apparently it's absolutely amazing for healing trauma. So I can't, I can't very well, you know, <laughs> you know. So it's probably not one to try on your own, is it? <laughs> <laughs> There's a program on Prime about that, isn't there? Doesn't it have um, Nicole Kidman in it? Oh, I don't no? know. I haven't seen that. Oh, I'm trying to think of it. It was based off a book um, and it's all about, she's a, I don't know if she's a qualified therapist, but she's a therapist that brings people in and basically gives them psychedelics within smoothies. So they go to a retreat to heal. Yeah, there we go. Well, apparently, interesting. interesting. That's actually worth, something worth considering, isn't it? You know, I mean, you know, um, if, if that's if that's your bag, uh, and I really have, I've talked to, I've talked to people, proper clinical psychologists who've done this and they say, it works. It works in a big way. So, um, you know, worth considering. There are other things as well. Um, so there's things that you can do yourself. Um, tapping is one of the things that you can do yourself. Now, I'm not sure that this is scientifically validated, but lots of people say that it works. And essentially what you do is you sort of tap on various meridians, it's, um, the acupressure points um, on your face and I think sort of on your shoulder blade and various, um, your um, clavicle and various other places as you process your thoughts there's a, a way of doing it you can get it off the internet or there's a book that you can get on it but apparently it's very very um powerful um so that's again it's free so you know ha give it a go it's something you can do yourself uh, there's something called logosynthesis and that's you use words essentially you, you repeat certain phrases and again that helps you process your memories and, and get gets rid of various um issues as well so logosynthesis is is also worth looking up and again, it's free. Um, so there's, there's various things that you can do like that for yourself um, if you can't afford a therapist. But um, there are also narcissistic abuse recovery coaches as well. So there's not just, um, it's not just formal therapy. Again, you know, there's not the, you don't have the accreditation thing there, but all sorts of wacky things um, can be used. It depends on who you are, you know, NLP, um, somatic experiencing, um, sh soul retrieval, shamanic soul retrieval, you know, this stuff works for people, you know, I mean, maybe it's placebo, maybe if you believe it's going to work, it, it's going to work. But, you know, why not give it a go? If it, if it's, you know, if it's something that you think might work for you, give it a go. Um, you know, I think it, I think it's there's a lot you can do without having to go to therapy. Um, one of the things that you mentioned that you mentioned acceptance, acceptance therapy, and something that maybe it's a link that I make in my head is with acceptance sometimes comes forgiveness. Is it necessary to forgive your abuser to heal from narcissistic abuse? No. Um, the short answer is no. Um, it is not. Absolutely not. And anybody who tells you it is, you know, um, is not helping you in any way they're invalidating you essentially no it's not you do not have to forgive your abuser to heal but you do have to forgive yourself um you have to forgive yourself you have to forgive as much as you know forgive the universe for putting you in that situation forgive your parents for you know you know thinking that the narcissist was a really lovely person and inviting them to sunday lunch that time when you got together you know forget every you know every just forget forgive all the other people everyone that you can essentially um you know but most importantly, forgive yourself. And that's a huge part of mindfulness as well. Mindfulness um, is about self-compassion as well. Um, it's really important to cultivate self-compassion. Huge, hugely important. I mentioned the inner critic earlier. I just want to briefly talk about the inner critic, if I may, because I just think, you know, with this, people who've been through this kind of abuse, that inner critic comes on. I call it the inner critic, the narcissist in your head. And essentially, you have internalized the narcissist and they're going, oh, you're, you're so rubbish. You're so this, you're so that. Oh, you can't do anything. Uh, you know, and they just it just goes on. And you you listen to this and you start to feel worse and worse and worse. That's just the narcissist in your head. And you can tell that narcissist to go to hell, essentially. And that's a really big for again, it's a big first step. 
you know, make sure you do that. Hear that, you know, when, when the narcissist in, in your head goes off on one, hear it and shut that narcissist down. You know, don't let that narcissist talk to you like that. You know, if, if that narcissist was talking to your best friend like that, you would shut them down. And yet you allow yourself to talk to you yourself like that. So that's really important. Self-compassion um, and, and, and being able to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself for allowing yourself to, to walk into this. It wasn't your fault. You know, forgive yourself. But no, you don't have to forgive your abuser. But maybe one day you will because... You know, um, that abuser um, became, well, a narcissist becomes the way that they are through to, but as a result of the way that they were brought up. So maybe in 20 years time, you will look back when you are on that rocking chair, you know, actually physically on that rocking chair. Um, maybe you will look back and think I've, I've been able to forgive my abuser, um, but it's not necessary at all. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming in again, because I tell you what, um, these sessions are so useful and so enlightening. Um, so that's it for this episode of Stow Talks. Thanks for listening. If you are at immediate risk of domestic abuse, please call the police or the National Domestic Abuse Helpline on 0808 2000 247. You can find out more about all the work that Sapria does at www.thelifedoctor.org and her online courses about narcissistic behaviours at drsapria.com. Sapria also has a podcast, Narcissists in Divorce, which is the top 5% of the world's most listened to, and a book, Divorcing a Narcissist, The Lure, The Loss and The Law, co-authored with family lawyer Karen Walker, which is a number one Amazon bestseller in the US. You can also follow Sapria on social media, where she regularly shares updates on the work she is doing. If you would like more information on our podcasts, head over to stotalks.co.uk and please rate, like, share and review this podcast where you can. 